Okay, let's now revise the chapter of inspection, inquiry and investigation. Starting from section number 206 till section number 229. So, it has uh, quite a few sections. The initial sections that is 206, 207, 208 and 209 relates to inspection and inquiry and the later sections are all about investigation except a few parts which apply to all the cases. Now, there are three terms involved in this particular chapter as you can very well see inspection, inquiry and investigation. What do we mean by these three terms? Of course, these three terms are different and you have to understand the difference then only you will be able to understand the provisions. Inspection is something that happens examination of books and accounts. Inquiry is uh, like asking people, interrogating people and all that who are involved and investigation is something which is next level. The detailed examination of things. So maybe first of all inspection is being ordered and if the result of inspection creates even more suspicion that there could be some fraudulent activities going on in the company then that results to investigation. So then investigation commences. Okay, so we have a whole flow of things. Let's start with section 206. Undoubtedly this is a revision class so not everything in uh, absolute detail but I'm going to explain you in such a manner that you understand the whole chapter. Section 206 company files a document undoubtedly um, we all know that with ROC a lot of documents is being filed a lot of information is being received by ROC supposedly ROC receives any piece of information for which ROC finds that the piece of information cre is creating some suspicion or is incomplete and seeks for more information. So at that particular point of time, ROC sends the first notice to the company. First notice not for inspection, not for inquiry, not for investigation but just for seeking some more information. On receipt of information. There are possible cases that you reply or you don't reply and even if you reply or you reply with some extended time, the reply may be satisfactory, the reply may be not satisfactory or the reply may be inadequate. So in case when the reply is not satisfactory, the reply is inadequate or you haven't replied at all, in all these three cases. Registrar gets a reason to go for inspection. That means it will call complete books and accounts and papers and inspect them. Right. So it gets a reason to do so. It will record the reasons and send you the second notice, which is of inspection. So now again calling off books and accounts, not just some piece of information, but books of accounts for inspection. Right. How inspection will be carried out? Inspection will be carried out according to section 207. Here one more power comes into picture which is of central government. Central government may also if it deems fit can order inspection. So maybe ROC carries out inspection on its own or CG appoints some inspector and that particular person carries out inspection. So quite possible uh, there are two cases whatever it be even if registrar or inspector whoever is carrying out the inspection on whatever grounds they prepare a report of their inspection which they are going to submit to central government right. Now when they submit the report they also give a recommendation that what is their analysis, what do they suggest that is there, could there be a probability of fraud involved, so should they go for investigation, what do they recommend, it's only their recommendation, this does not bind central government to initiate investigation, okay, so it's just their recommendation. So report made and submitted to CG under section 208 with recommendation then CG may carry out investigation. Now inquiry is also given in the same section 206 which tells us that any piece of information again anyone approaches registrar or registrar receives some information and 
registrar is satisfied that some fraudulent activities are going on in the company or there is non-compliance provisions or the grievances of people are not being addressed. So in these three situations, registrar, what will registrar do? Registrar will inform the company that these allegations have been imposed against you. If company can uh, give an adequate reply, great. Otherwise, registrar will give an opportunity of being heard to the company undoubtedly and thereafter initiate inquiry. In the same manner, CG had the power to initiate inspection. Here also, CG also has the power to direct inquiry. So, CG may appoint inspector for the same. So, and they'll carry out inquiry. So, registrar or inspector can carry out inspection or inquiry as given under section 206. How they carry out inquiry or inspection as given under section 207. So after the order of inspection or inquiry is passed, registrar or inspector, they call for books of accounts and other papers and it is going to be the duty of the officers and employees past plus present. They are going to produce books and papers, furnish information and give all assistance. If they don't, imprisonment and or fine and if they do then registrar is going to conduct inspection or inquiry. What powers are given to them? They get the same powers as of civil court. They can also place identification marks, take copies of the books, papers etc. And after they have completed the inspection or inquiry they will submit the report to central government as given in section 208. Now, sometimes it may also happen that central government wants report in between inspection. The inspection is yet not over, inspection is going on and central government wants some report, updation as to what is happening. In such cases, you have to submit interim report. So, ROC or inspector will give interim report to CG if they so direct and otherwise on completion of investigation, uh, on completion of inspection of inquiry, final report shall be submitted. Now, this power to receive report has been delegated to regional director. Next, we have the section of search and seizure. This power is also given to registrar or inspector but they have this power only when they take approval from central government. Sometimes it may so happen that they know or uh, during inspection or inquiry they come to know that there might be a situation that some documents of the company are missing and these documents may be destroyed by people involved or they may be mutilated, they may be secreted, they may be falsified. In such situations, in such situations, you go to the special court, you obtain the permission of special court, not of CG but of special court. So registrar or inspector after obtaining special court's permission, they can enter into the places, they can search and seize the documents. Seized documents means you are taking the documents into your custody. Now when you are taking the documents into your custody, the company might ask for some photocopies. So you will allow them to take photocopies and seize the documents and take them with you. There is a limit of 180 days that you can keep these seized documents only for 180 days and thereafter you are bound to return them. If you want uh, to examine more then you can again call them back, right? So you have to remember two important points in section 209 which is uh, entering into the premises with special court's permission and keeping the seized documents only for 180 days. Why am I telling you to remember these two important points? Because when we read the seizure under investigation, this is a seizure over here. When we read about search and seizure under investigation, that is section 220, then these two points are missing in that section. No restriction to inspector under investigation. They don't need to seek any approval from special court. 
moreover they also don't have this restriction of 180 days so exactly replica section is 220 with that difference okay so that we will read now these were the four sections relating to inspection and inquiry now we start with the sections of investigation we have five sections of investigation three sections about investigation into affairs of the company one section about investigation into membership of the company and um, another section about uh, investigation into affairs of other companies related companies you can say right so 210 212 213 216 and 219 so we have these five sections of investigation now we are talking about the first three sections first that is you are investigating into affairs of any company right what happens when can you investigate that is the first question when can you investigate see after submission of a report by the inspector or ROC after they have done inspection or inquiry they submit the report to central government along with the recommendation central government receives the report and central government based on the report decides whether I want to carry out further investigation or not so on receipt of report CG may order investigation secondly the members of the company have a very strong doubt that some fraudulent activities are going in the company so they pass a special resolution and they send the special resolution to company by suggesting that it is our wish that you must carry out investigation of this particular company again CG has a choice it may it may not and in public interest also CG may do so so section 210 there are four grounds there are four grounds on which investigation may be carried out by central government however the fourth ground that is in front of nclt some proceedings are going on where nclt or court discovers that this company has some problems some serious issues and investigation must be carried out so nclt directs cg to carry out investigation so since an order is being passed it is the duty of central government to carry out investigation so in the first three instances cg has a choice in the last ground as mentioned in section 210 cg doesn't have a choice and has to must order investigation right so whatever it be cg may order cg must order the order of investigation has been passed after passing the order of investigation cg appoints an inspector cg appoints inspector in some cases if cg finds that the case is big the case is huge the case is serious and it needs more expert people to be employed to investigate into the fraud or the scam possible scam then in such a situation cg doesn't appoint inspector to investigate into the case rather assigns the case to a special dedicated office which is SFIO serious fraud investigation office just like we have CBI <coughs> okay that is section 212 I told you there are three sections of investigation into affairs of the company one is 210 where there are four grounds on which CG orders investigation second is 212 where CG assigns the case to SFIU and third is 213 where where members don't go to CG by passing SR rather some eligible members go to NCLT and files a complaint they file an application and NCLT in turn if find suited then orders CG 
So you make a direct application to NCLT and NCLT orders CG and thereafter investigation takes place. Ultimately, CG is only doing the investigation. CG is either appointing inspectors or assigning the case to SFIU. But then there are three sections. I hope you get that, right? Now section 213 where who can make an application to NCLT either the members or any person. Which members, if the company has share capital, then at least 100 members or members with 10% voting power. And if the company doesn't have share capital, then one fifth of the members. They become the eligible members with support and documents and reasons. They can make applications seeking investigation to tribunal or any other person can make application. But when any other person make application, tribunal has to be satisfied of any fraud or any unlawful activity, any oppression, if the company is formed for unlawful purpose, the management or the promoters are involved in fraud or the members are not being given incomplete, are not being given complete information. So in such situations, tribunal, after giving reasonable opportunity of being heard to parties, after giving reasonable opportunity of being heard to parties, then, 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 decide about investigation that whether investigation should be carried out or not and if tribunal decides that yes investigation should be carried out then it is going to direct cg the same and cg is bound to order investigation cg cannot say that okay i'll see whether it has to be done or not no so cg will appoint inspector and uh, the inspector will prepare a report and give it to central government okay now comes into picture sfio what is SFIU? The establishment of SFIU is given in section 211, which is not a very important section. It just tells us about the composition. CG has the power that by notification it can establish SFIU and it has done that. Head office, Delhi, it has director, it has experts, it has the number of employees, the terms and conditions as prescribed, etc, etc. Now, the important section is 212 where central government assigns some cases of investigation to SFIU. Which cases, ma'am? That is completely a discretionary choice of government. However, in these four cases, government can do so. When government receives a report under section 208, when SR is being passed by the company in public interest, which is an open ground, and on request from department of CG or SG, Central government is of the opinion that investigation must be carried out by SFIU only, then it assigns the case to SFIU. When the investigation is started by SFIU, all other investigating agencies will stop their investigation. Whatever their findings are, they are going to give it to SFIU. Fine? Okay. Now, what will SFIU do? SFIU the director of SFIU, that is the highest authority, will appoint an investigating officer who will also be called as an inspector under the Act. That person is going to conduct the investigation in the prescribed manner. Ma'am, it has to be a detailed evaluation, a detailed examination. So what do you think? How much power should be given to him? That means who he can call, who he can ask, where he can he go from, where can he extract information, what can he arrest, etc, etc. So what powers are given to him? He is given the powers which are given under section 217. So we have a separate section for the powers which will be given to him. Okay, as of that matter, the powers which are given to any inspector during investigation. Apart from the general powers which are given to inspector, he also has a power, a very special power that you will not see in Companies Act ever. And the subsection which is very important, 212 subsection 6, 212 6. That gives the power to arrest. So the offences under this section are cognizable. That means people can be arrested even without warrant. However, not anyone can go and arrest them. Someone not below the assistant director, that is assistant director, additional director and director. On these orders only, arrest can take place. Right. So if someone is found guilty of offense, that means 
I get some material information during my investigation and I'm sure that I have this evidence and I know that this particular person is involved in fraud. So I can arrest that person if I have that authority undoubtedly. So I can go out and arrest that person. Now when I arrest that person, I have to do two things. First, arrest order plus this material information, I have to give it to SFIU so that my department clearly knows that this arrest has taken place on these material grounds. Secondly, I have to produce this person in front of the magistrate or court within 24 hours. Now, when I present, the other person would want a bail, right? Bail will not be given so easily. That means there are strict conditions of bail. Bail will only be given when public prosecutor has been given an opportunity to oppose the bail. That means government lawyer our lawyer will go and oppose the bail. So once he opposes the bail, then court has to decide. If court is satisfied that this person who has been arrested is not guilty and he must be released on bail, he's an innocent person, he will not commit any offense when I release him on bail. If court is satisfied of that thing, then only the court will release him on bail. But, but, sick infirm under the 60 under the age of 16 and woman these are the four people who get relief that means even if um, special court if they want they will not give an opportunity to public prosecutor to oppose the bail and grant bail so it is at the discretion of special court in those cases okay so here we have the whole um, part of arrest here here we have the whole part of arrest the inspector appointed will carry out the investigation, submit the report to central government. If central government directs, then it will also submit interim report, otherwise just the final report. And um, the report may state that yes, these people have committed fraud. So CG will take an action in pursuance of the report. What will be that action? CG will direct SFIU that we file the complaint and start the prosecution against these people. That means the legal proceedings will be started and adequately they will get the punishment. If some person has got some uh, benefit, then to recover that benefit, CG will file an application with NCLT and that is related, that is known as order of disgorgement so nclt will pass an order of disgorgement that is for recovery of all the illegal gains that have been made by the persons right okay so that was about investigation into affairs of the company moving on to investigation into membership of the company sometimes it may so happen that on record there are is uh, another member but actually the benefit is being passed on to some other member which we call as beneficial owner also as we have read in section 89 and 90 of the act uh, significant beneficial owner and all that part so sometimes it may so happen that the control is being uh, projected as in someone's hand but is actually not in that person's hand so sometimes you need to figure out who the real owner is, then only we will be able to establish that what is the fraud, where the money is flowing and a lot of other things. So if a complaint is being made by some person or CO2 by government or by reference by NCLT, then CG shall order and in these situations CG may order investigation into membership, right? to determine who are the financially interested people who are able to control the policy, who are beneficial owners, etc. So for this regard also, CG shall appoint inspector who shall investigate into matters relating to the company and membership and shall report it to central government. Now, when you are discovering about the membership or when you are discovering about the ownership, it may so happen that you want certain restrictions to be imposed upon securities. You want to find out who the security or where the benefit is going on. And before you could reach that person, the transfer of securities is taking place from one person to another, another to another. So you want this to break. In such situation, or if any person files a complaint, then tribunal understands that I must find out the details about this particular security and to find out the details I'm 
must put some restrictions. In such situation, tribunal can put restrictions but not for more than three years. This is something which is very important for you to remember that tribunal although has been given the power under section 222 to impose restrictions yet the restrictions cannot be imposed for more than three years. Okay, now um, investigation into affairs of related companies. Related companies does not mean the related party definition that we have read. Related companies means the companies or the entities which have been specified in section 219 only. So when an inspector is investigating into the affairs of a company under these three sections, he believes that to find out the whole truth, I also must investigate into these related companies. Then after taking approval from CG, he can do that. Now, what are the related companies? Subsidiary, holding, subsidiary of holding. It could be passed also. Managing director, manager, employee. Any body corporate which is being managed by the managing director or manager. It may so happen that currently or the manager and it was being managed by the past or currently it is being managed, you are the past uh, manager. So is, was, it could be, right? Any body corporate whose board of directors includes the nominees of these companies or any body corporate whose board of directors are according are acting according to the directions given by the directors of this company. So in such situations, there is a link between these two companies and quite possible there are a lot of transaction flows from one company to the other related company and to find out the whole truth where the actually money is going I need to investigate into affairs of these companies also. So after taking central government's approval, you can do that. Next is section 221. Next is section 221, which talks about freezing of assets. Freezing of assets of a company. Freezing of assets of a company. See, if central government makes a reference, or if a complaint is made by members specified under section 244 that is uh, oppression and mismanagement or if creditors file a complaint to creditors who have at least one lakh amount outstanding or any other person they file an application to tribunal and tribunal believes that company might be disposing of might be selling off some assets which is not in the best interest of the company, which is prejudicial to the interest of creditors, members, then in such a situation, tribunal can put restrictions on these assets, just like it was putting restrictions on securities to find out the whole truth. It is putting restrictions on assets also. It is freezing the assets. That means it is giving the direction that you cannot remove, transfer or dispose of the assets. But again, the restriction is going to be for maximum three years only. It cannot be for more than three years. It cannot be for more than three years. Okay, ma'am. Now, section 220. I told you we have a section 209 which is exactly replica of 220 except for the two differences that I told you. So during investigation if for inspector has reasonable grounds to believe that books are going to be or are likely to be mutilated, altered, destroyed, falsified, secreted then inspector may enter seize and uh, search and seize documents and return them on completion of investigation not within 180 days and no permission from special court. Okay. Fine? Okay. Now, the next section that we are going to discuss is inspector's report. <coughs> Here I will give you some clarification. <coughs> we have read about inspection and inquiry and its report under section 208. So, when inspection or inquiry takes place, the report is submitted under section 208. When investigation takes place, the report is given in section 223 and 
the action that has to be taken after receipt of report is given under section 224. However, however, when investigation is being carried out by SFIO, when investigation is being carried out by SFIO, then what report has to be submitted, in what manner, what actions shall be taken after submission of report, all that part is given in section 212 itself. Okay, so section 223 as well as section 224, it is about investigation, it is for the cases of investigation except section 2112 that is SFI. Fine. So, apart from the inspector appointed uh, under section 212, all other inspectors after investigation have to submit a report undoubtedly to central government. If central government wants an interim report, then you also have to give an interim report. The report is going to be obtained, uh, sorry, the report is going to be authenticated by seal or certificate of public officer. Remember, I explained you the whole procedure of public officer in the class, in the main class, right? That who is a public officer, how the things happen so that you get that practical knowledge as well. And a copy may be obtained by making an application to central government. So if you want to know what is the result of this particular investigation, what happened, what was the scope and everything, you can obtain the copy of it from make, by making an application to a central government. Central government is going to give you that, okay? Now when central government receives the report, <coughs> what actions it can take? in pursuance of the report. Central government receives the report, central government studies the report and finds out that okay these five people were involved in fraud. So undoubtedly these five people have to get punishment. So central government will initiate prosecution against these people. So legal proceedings will be started and adequately they will be punished. Now this is one thing. Central government after receiving the report finds out that it's important that the company must be closed. So we must sell off the lab, uh, assets, pay off the liability. So winding a petition may be filed by CG. It may also so happen that central government finds the case of oppression or mismanagement and hence CG files an application to NCLT for obtaining relief from oppression and mismanagement or both application may also be filed. So first thing, CG initiates prosecution against the defaulters. Second, makes an application for winding up or relief from oppression or both. Third, makes files a suit for recovery of property or damages. It may so happen that the company involved has lost a lot of property because of fraud. So for recovering that property, CG has filed a suit on behalf of the company. And when CG has filed a suit, CG will be indemnified by the company because CG is recovering the property on their behalf. Right. And lastly, lastly, disgorgement. If someone has got illegal gain out of this fraud, then that money can be recovered from him. How? CG makes an application to tribunal because tribunal is the judicial authority over here. CG is not the judicial authority. So CG will make an application to tribunal. Tribunal will pass the orders of recovery that is orders of disgorgement. Okay. Fine. Now, um, see, we also have a section 225 and a 214, which are both related type of section. Often, there is a confusion amongst students that, ma'am, so much of investigation is taking place, then uh, who is going to bear the expenses of investigation? That is the question, right? See, one is section 214 which initiates uh, just to rule out uh, not so serious applications what happens if if someone has filed a complaint to cg or there is sr being passed by the company and cg receives that sr and cg 
initiates investigation. Before appointing inspector, it will ask the applicant that you deposit a sum not exceeding 25,000 as a security. Because we are going to take an action on your request. What if the request is uh, some uh, uh, fake evidence and some false request? So you submit some security. If this turns out to be false, then you will not get your money back. But if this turns out to be true and actually some fraud has taken place and this results in finding someone as guilty, then this money will be refunded to you. So if, if it doesn't end up in uh, prosecution, then we will use that money to carry out the inspection investigation and, and we will uh, take the help of company whoever is involved in whatever uh, miss, uh, not so in order things. Otherwise, if this results in prosecution, that means the end result of investigation is such that we find some people guilty. So whoever has been found guilty, we will recover from them. If if the investigation ends up in recovering some property of the company, then from that property, central government will have first charge on that property. It can use that property to reimburse the money. So all that portion is given in section 225, right? So that's how central government obtains or central government gets money to carry out this process of investigation. If it doesn't end up in prosecution, of course, the applicants and the company concerned. Fine. Okay. Now, procedure powers of inspector section 217 so whoever is carrying out investigation um, and uh, some part of inspection and inquiry they have these powers what are the powers they can call for information and it will be the duty of past plus present officers to preserve books to produce books and to give all assistance now whenever an inspector is taking books they can keep them in their custody for only 180 days. Ma'am, earlier you told that there is no limit. I told that there is no limit under section 220. That is the section of Caesar. This is a normal section when you ask for books and papers and you have taken books and papers. There you have entered into premises and you have seized the books and papers. Okay. So that is the difference. Now you can examine people in oath. Which people? Anyone. No, not anyone. The employee, the officers, you can examine them on oath. But if you want to examine some other person, then you have to seek approval from CG and then you can do that. You will get the same powers as of civil court. All the pillars, other authorities, government, they all are going to provide you assistance if needed when you take the, hair, when you take the uh, approval from CG. There is one special point in section 217 which talks about reciprocal arrangements which talks about reciprocal arrangements what happens in that see it is very easy to discover truth find out evidence inquire people in our country but when the laws change to get evidence from a foreign source is extremely difficult for that if we want to obtain some evidence from a foreign country we have to check whether our government has a reciprocal arrangement with them or not if they have a reciprocal arrangement it gets extremely easy how we will tell our indian court that there is an evidence which is out there indian court will send a letter of request to foreign court foreign court will summon that person who is concerned will inquire that person, will collect evidences and give it back to the Indian court and Indian court will give it to the inspector concerned and he will prepare the report. Likewise, since it is a reciprocal arrangement, so give and take. Foreign court, if they want some evidence from our country, they will send a letter of request. Our government will forward it to Indian court. Indian court will either summon the person himself or uh, call the inspector and assign the case to him. Inspector will investigate, inspector will prepare a report, collect evidences, give it to the court, court will give it to the government, government will give it to foreign court. I hope you get the procedure. So it's give and take. These reciprocal arrangements may be um, there. Okay. 
Now, another section protection of employees. The employees get sometimes scared to disclose the insider information of a company during investigation just because they may be fired later. To protect them, if an investigation is being carried out under these sections, all the five sections are mentioned over here, or some pendency of proceedings of prevention of oppression and mismanagement, in both these cases, in both these cases, if the company proposes to suspend an employee, dismiss him, demote him, right, or uh, change his terms of employment to his disadvantage, then in all these cases, it will not be allowed unless you take approval from tribunal. So you have to file, the company has to file an application to tribunal that I'm proposing to dismiss this particular employee when the investigation is going on. The tribunal will not uh, give you a reply like, okay, fine, you dismiss him or do, don't dismiss him. No, you have to wait for 30 days. Within 30 days, either tribunal will send a notice of objection or tribunal will stay silent. If you don't receive any objection notice from tribunal within 30 days, then company can proceed and take action against that employee. Okay. Now, if, if, Tribunal objects and the company is not satisfied with it, company can file an appeal to NCLAT within 30 days. Okay, apart from this, we have section 226, which uh, is a very small section and sta states that doesn't matter you have passed SR for winding up, doesn't matter any winding up proceedings are going on, doesn't matter there's an application for oppression and mismanagement these things are not going to affect the investigation. So, despite that, if an investigation comes into picture, it is going to be carried out. We have another section, section 227, which tells us an inspector cannot compel the legal advisor to disclose any information other than client's name and address. Likewise, an inspector cannot compel banker to disclose any information other than information related to the company concerned. Banker cannot be compelled to disclose information of other customers, right? And uh, section 228, which uh, tells us that the provisions of inspection, inquiry and investigation are going to be applicable to foreign company also. And section 229, that if in the whole process you do some fraudulent activity, that means you give some false answer to the inspector, you make some false entry, you try to destroy some paper, anything like that, then you will be attracted to the section of fraud. What is the section of fraud which gives the punishment for fraud? It is section 447, right? So that's it with the revision of inspection, inquiry and investigation.